Remember when Whitebeard said, your face makes my scar given by that bastard ache again. So he can be referring to Garling. You know, I do remember that. When Shanks met Whitebeard in chapter 434, he said exactly that. When I look at your face, it makes my scars ache. The scars I got from him. And I'd always thought that Whitebeard was referring to Roger because he and Whitebeard were old rivals. And then remember, this is back in the day when we didn't know that Whitebeard was just a big old teddy bear. At this stage, he could have been a serious, serious antagonist. So it wouldn't have been at all weird for him to refer to good guy Roger in such a bad blah, blah, blah kind of way. But theoretically, both Garling and Whitebeard could have been on God Valley. Garling because he was the God Valley King and Whitebeard as part of the Rocks Pirates. In fact, maybe Whitebeard was defeated by Garling whilst Roger and Garling took down rocks. And if so, that would automatically elevate Garling to insane levels of hype. The man who scarred and perhaps even defeated Whitebeard. With that said, I would still err on the side of Roger, if only because it's hard to know how much Whitebeard knows about Shanks. I imagine his world noble heritage is probably quite secret, or, or, or maybe not actually. The thing is that we as readers know almost nothing about Shanks, but maybe the whole Figula name is public knowledge and it's just been kept from us. Also, two other things I noticed going back on chapter 434. One is that Shanks asked Marco to join his crew, just as he did after Wano. So Shanks, he really wants that Marco. And also Whitebeard mentions Haki by name, which kind of blew my mind because Haki is mentioned so much earlier in the series than I remembered. Garling Figalin's line of dialogue about protecting scum contrasts really nice against Shanks, considering his fleet was made up of misfits to protect them. That is actually a brilliant point. It goes a bit underrated because this was in the same chapter as Divine Departure, but Shanks' grand fleet actually make me a much bigger fan of him. It's your classic hero stuff, but I like that he goes out of his way to protect the weak. And thinking about it, that could be a conscious choice to rebel against the principles of the world nobles, of which he was one. And that would actually make Shanks' story very similar to Sabo's story, both having the blood of nobility, but dedicating their lives to help those deemed irrelevant, especially Shanks' fleet. I don't even know how the world nobles would react to them. I don't even think they would be deemed worthy of being slaves. Because realistically, how much work can you expect from say, Grave Tooth Fuga? At best, I think they'd feed Ribatini to their pet piranhas or something, but I wonder if Garling's line is a direct reference to Shanks, a crimson stain on the Figaland family name. And perhaps most guard was dealt with particularly brutally because his infraction reminds Garling so much of Shanks. That's Shanks. I want to make it known that I also tried to construct a period joke because Garling, he has a moon head and moons, they follow monthly cycles and Shanks red stain. Like there's a lot of elements there, but in the end, it just didn't work out. Shanks's daddy having moon haircut is is weirdly symbolic, a satellite to the five elder planets, so to speak. So at this point, I think we're on the verge of stepping out of symbolism and getting much closer to just literal. The five elders obviously all represent planets and each of the ancient weapons are also named after planets. And the only planet we have remaining to designate is Earth, which is theorized to be Emu. And if Garling is the number one power guy within the world nobles, then it makes sense to have him as our satellite moon. Then it would also be a nice subversion of fate that Shanks went on to become the mentor of the sun god given his his moon-based heritage. Then again, the moon is also very important for the ancient kingdom side of things as well. Wano in particular has very strong moon representation. So as much as our metaphorical narrative solar system seems to be approaching completion, we still don't really know how the sun and the moon play into things. Then again, the One Piece planet has multiple moons, so we could have good moons and like oppressive evil moons. Also, I don't have it here, but someone did ask if Garland could use armament Haki on his moon hair. And the answer to that is, I certainly hope so. The end of the chapter felt like Ivankov speculating about all the fan theories and I'm here for it. I briefly mentioned this in the chapter review, but yes, Ivankov went full YouTuber. It is legitimately as if his dialogue was actually written by one of us. And given that we know how the Ope Ope no Mi works, that would indicate that it's definitely been used at some stage in the past. And given that Emu has the same name as one of the founding ancient kings, then these potentially unrelated threads simply must combine together to form the perfect double helix theory structure. And you know what? As much of an in-world conspiracy theory as it is, I think he's on the money. That is why they wanted us to know the eternal youth ability to tell us about Emu. I knew it. Lore is not destined to die. I, uh, I wish I had your confidence. Unfortunately, Lore has two pretty terrible things going for him or against him. Guess bad things don't normally go for you. One of which is regardless of whether it's been used or not, Lore does have Chekhov's magical fruit. And the fact that he does have an ultimate ability is still narratively begging for it to be used. And secondly, he's a D and things don't 
generally end well if you're a D. It's almost as if many, if not all of them, are quite literally destined to die, but die to fulfill a purpose. It's a very bittersweet ending for every D that we've seen die so far. Bittersweet and early. We have yet to see a D die of satisfactory old age. And uh, not gonna lie, that's what makes me a little bit nervous about Law. Due to being a D, he is a piece actively being wielded by fate. He doesn't have the luxury of just sitting back, chilling and going unnoticed, quietly living out the rest of his days. Because as a D, his job is to quite literally cause storms and storms are dangerous. So uh, I, I don't know about Law. The Mother Flame sounds like the ancient civilization fuel source. All right, so there's a little bit of confusion about this because there have been a couple of different power sources mentioned on Eckhart Island and they may be the same thing, but also maybe not. So the ancient fuel source is the one that powered the big robot. And in the series, it's referred to by Shaka as the dynamic power source. Meanwhile, Egghead Island itself is powered entirely by fire. And Lilith mentions her theory of an undying flame that would allow them to create their own sun. And actually going back on it in the official translation, it's not clear whether or not this is actually a hypothesis. Or I should say, it's not clear that it's still a hypothesis. Because the way Lilith said it could also be read as, yeah, I thought this idea would be cool, and then we did it. And that's how Egghead Island works. So this could be the breakthrough Emu was talking about with the Mother Flames. Vegapunk's invention may not have been the actual device Emu used to destroy Lelucia, but instead the fuel source that powered that device. For example, let's say that Emu did have the ancient weapon Uranus. That's great, but just like the ancient robot, he may not have been able to use it without the right power source. So Vegapunk invents something eerily similar, and all of a sudden he has unleashed a whole new era of destruction on the world. Or actually, he's unleashed a whole old era of destruction on the world. So again, maybe Ivankov was onto something. And if so, I wonder if Pluton functions on a similar, if not same fuel source. From a meta perspective, the reason why this is a cool discussion is because Vegapunk obviously takes visual inspiration from a certain Albert Einstein, whose famous equals MC squared equation is the breakthrough that made the atomic bomb possible. So whilst not directly contributing to the project, his work did lead to its construction and implementation, which is very much what could have happened here with Vegapunk. How's the weather in Australia? It's, uh, it's all right. I would say it's unusually warm for winter, which is a bit annoying. But then again, I'm just glad anytime it's not summer. Summer, too hot. It's crazy. Ima really showed how cold he is, since he was so willing to annihilate Lucia just because of it being close. Even the Gorosei were surprised, but Emu didn't care. This is actually a really revealing conversation. Prior to this, most people, including me, speculated that Lucia was targeted for a reason, like a carefully assessed reason, something that would be strategically beneficial. But in the end, it really was kind of arbitrary. I mean, obviously it was picked because it was one of the rebelling nations, but there were also like seven or eight other ones of those we could have chosen from. So to think it was only chosen due to being the closest really puts fate into perspective. That's why the elders were going on about how Sabo was so unlucky to have ended up there. They weren't targeting him, Lelucia had no greater purpose in the grand scheme of things, and so both Sabo and Lelucia were just kind of unlucky. Also in this chapter, there's a technical explanation of how the world government thought Sabo was actually on the island because he used the telepathic snail equivalent of a VPN. And I just wanted to point that out because it's cool to see the revolutionary army doing clever things. At the moment, I don't think we get enough of that. They don't have the raw power required, so they need to make up for that with intelligence. I just love how there is so much buildup for the reveal of the names of the elders, just for them to be named stuff like Ethan. I mean, yeah. In a series with names like Rox, Deza Beck, and Nefertari D. Lily, you don't often expect a major character to pop up and go, hi, my name's Marcus. I enjoy long walks on the red line, brutally murdering traitorous Nefertari scum, and of course, caring for the environment. I mean, the names do still sound quite grandiose, like English old money, but combined with their roles, they also make the entire world government sound like a small to medium sized business. What's that, Sakazuki? You have a problem with your pay slip this week? We'll just go talk to Ethan in finance. He'll sort you out. Speaking of Ethan though, he actually has what sounds like a Japanese name in addition to the Ethan, the Nusjura part. So I wonder if his family have a connection to Wano. He also does have what looks like the Shodai Kitetsu. Not that I can imagine him using it much in his capacity as financial coordinator. Ah, you know what he probably does? I bet he uses it like the oil dipstick in a car. What he does, right, is Ethan plunges his sword into this like gigantic pile of money. And then he measures how much money there is, depending on how high up the sword it goes. This is gonna sound cold, but I don't feel any sympathy, or sadness rather, for most guard. Bro laid down his life for the fishman, and he sought it to the end. Good for you, bro. You've thoroughly redeemed yourself. I do feel sorry for him, but I think it's only because we've never actually seen him do the horrible things that the world nobles do. That is a massive part about why most guard is redeemable at all, because Oda off-screened all of his previous horrible acts. But I do think there is something quite 
quite nice about the idea of a world noble sacrificing themselves for a mermaid, given their specific factional tension. And there's also something quite bittersweet in regards to having Otohime and Most Guard becoming martyrs for both sides. Sort of like an astronaut goldfish version of Romeo and Juliet, just without all of the all of the sexual tension. And Most Guard's death is still unconfirmed at this point, but if he does die, I imagine that it would need to serve a purpose. Primarily because this is one piece, so someone, or someones, plural, may then go on to inherit Most Guard's will. Perhaps there's a faction of world nobles that he's been gathering that share his ideals who will spring into action. I mean, Most Guard has had 10 years since meeting Otohime, so I doubt that this whole decade has purely been spent on a journey of self-reflection. Is it possible that Steli is inheriting Emu's will? When Steli saw the throne, he immediately thought of wanted to sit there, as well as the hairstyle of both characters seeming similar. Steli is definitely the person who displays the most characteristics of a world noble, despite not having their blood. He's mostly a gross caricature of human evil and is often used as a gag, but he is an interesting character. And I think a point may come in the series where we need to draw a line between who can be redeemed and who cannot. So the question then is, will there come a point where Steli, even Steli, cannot accept the world noble's decisions and actions? And I don't have the answer to that. All I know is if I were Steli, I'd be pretty damn careful because his kingdom is single-handedly responsible for producing most of the world government's biggest enemies. All the silhouettes lately are probably due to Oda's eye problem, meaning the next time we encounter Emu in the story, we should be able to actually see them. So in case you didn't know, Oda has some pretty bad astigmatism, which is an eye problem, and that's why One Piece is taking a four week break so that he can have the surgery and have the recovery. His message is pretty fun though, because he says he hopes that after surgery, he'll be able to fire lasers from his eyes. And it's an interesting idea though, the, uh, the Emu part, not the laser eyes, the idea that the worse Oda's vision gets, the more vague the character drawings need to be. Maybe to Oda's eye at the time, these wacky elder silhouettes were perfectly and vividly detailed masterpieces. So he'll come back from surgery, look at them again and go, oh, God, what have we been drawing? Also, it should be said that Oda might have already had the surgery before this announcement was made, because the way manga is produced means that authors usually work about three to four weeks ahead. So while One Piece is on break now, Oda's break may have started earlier, and he may also be back at work sooner. Or not, I have no real idea, but I do wish Oda a speedy recovery, and if not granted laser eyes, then at least a pair of nipple lights for good measure.